Hello and welcome to Catholic Focus. My name is Kudakwasha Matambo. Today on our exclusive interview, we are talking to the president of the Zimbabwe Catholic Bishops Conference, who is also the Bishop of Mutare Diocese and the Bishop Chairman of Social Communications, His Lordship Sekuru Paul Oren. Sekuru, welcome to Catholic Focus. Thank you very much. Now, many people know you as a bishop, as a Carmelite priest. Some would know you as uh, Monsignor before you became the bishop. But um, what is it that people don't know about you? What is your story? I hail from Ireland, um, which is next door to the UK. I came to Zimbabwe in 2001. Um, I come from a family of 10 children and number seven. Uh, six boys and four girls. Uh, my father, father died um, in, 2000 and, in 2001, but my mother is still well and uh, we are in contact quite frequently. Um, and with the rest of the family, especially through re the most more modern technology of Zoom, Zoom meetings. Um, so, yes, yeah, so in, in 19... 89 I was working as an accountant in the in London and then decided to uh, to change paths and to join the Carmelite order in Ireland uh, which I did in September uh, 1989 and went through the different stages of formation and was ordained priest in 1997 after which I went to the, the uh, United States uh, of America for further studies uh, and then came to Zimbabwe, uh, joining the Carmelite Mission in September uh, 2001. So um, now 22, 23 years, 22 years here in Zimbabwe. I do remember 2016 at Marymount Teachers College when you were installed um, as the Bishop of Mutare Diocese. Earlier on, I had met you at um, Christian Mambo where you were uh, the chaplain at the school there, but also working with the novices. How is your work as a bishop now? What has changed? So when I arrived in Zimbabwe, I was uh, posted to Kusimamba Mission uh, under the Carmelite order and worked there um, for about six years and then went to St. Killian's Mission also in the Diocese of Mutari and then went back to, to um, Kusimamba as they in, to work in the school, uh, Chris Mamba High School, and then up to, for another seven seven years, then I went to our Camelot House in Nazura, uh, the Prophet Elijah Priory. Um, the big difference I would say between that pastoral and formation work and work uh, in administration in school is the, um, just the, the volume of work and the, the wider scope of the work. Uh, um, in that it uh, concerns now the Diocese of Mutari, we have 30 missions and um, a lot of institutions and commissions. So I'm not able to give all my time to one particular area like I was able to do previously. Now I've just got to try to, to support all the different um, areas of life uh, as a bishop. Um, so there's a certain discipline I have to exercise in, in trying to spread my time and attention so that uh, every mission, every commission, every everyone that seeks my, uh, my, my time, I can allocate as fairly as possible uh, so that the diocese moves on uh, and that I'm available to people as much as possible. And adding to that volume of your work, um, you now work as the uh, president of the bishops' conference. What does that What does that involve? The, the post of um, bishop president. We rotate on on through the with the different bishops. It was my turn to start, so it's a two year uh, assignment, and we can be re-elected if if we wished uh, for a second two years. It basically uh, is kind of. Uh, a post of receiving a lot of information, especially from Rome. And then I, through the Secretary General, uh, have that information distributed to the rest of the, to the other bishops and to other maybe organizations. 
It also, we have six meetings every year as a conference, so I, I chair those meetings. Um, and I sometimes have to meet people on behalf of the conference. And also last year, in 2022, I had to attend two conferences. Um, the conference of INBISA, which is, is the number of countries in Southern Africa, and then the conference of SECAM, which represents all the dioceses of Africa. The, the, the three-year conferences of both organizations took place last year, one in Namibia and the other in, in Ghana. So, yes, we're just trying to, we're here to coordinate the work of the conference and to work closely with the Secretary General on, on especially correspondence and signing. I have to sign more documents now as the president than I, I did before. But uh, it's, uh, it's just giving me an, an insight on how the church generally operates just outside of the diocese. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if this work gives you an insight of how the church works, mm -hmm. you can imagine how many people, you know, really want to know how the church works and even your work as a, as a bishop. You have mentioned about the discipline that you now have to you know, exercise as a bishop because of the amount of work. Mm -hmm. But what are some of the joys, you know, things that make you happy to be a bishop? I would say the variety of work and the variety of people I, I, I meet. Um, the great joy of, of seeing the church grow, uh, especially here in Zimbabwe, maybe more particular to the Diocese of um, Mutari. Uh, we've been blessed with quite a number of vocations, the, the joys of ordination days, the number of sisters has maintained and is, is still quite strong. Um, and to see the people coming together for different events, uh, is, is, it's a bit daunting to to preside over, uh, you know, where there's a large gathering of people. But at the same time, there's a great joy to know that this is God's family and I'm there to, to serve the people that are, that are coming together in His name. So um, once I feel it's an act of service, it's at this particular post, like any leadership post, there's a um, potential to become very proud and to, to, to boost one's ego. But, uh, you know, the great um, discipline is to see it as an act of service that I'm there like Pope Francis or the other bishops or any Christian leaders or even any civil leaders who are there to serve the people that we're called to serve as best we can. Mm -hmm. uh, your diocese has many areas that were hit by Cyclone Idai and also faces a lot of threats from this cyclone. Um, cyclone Freddy, if we can also mention. When Cyclone Idai hit the areas in your diocese, what was your personal experience that particular time? Yes, the Cyclone Idai took place on Friday, 15 March um, um, 2019, if I get the year right, before COVID. Was, uh, um, I'll always remember the, 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 the night or the following morning we, we, we had heavy rain in Mutari and quite strong winds. Um, perhaps we were being told about this cyclone that was coming, but it didn't, it hadn't really fully registered, I think, people, the, the severity of it. So about three o'clock, two to three o'clock in the morning, I received a phone call from uh, the Vicar General at the time, Father Ambrose Vigneault, telling me um, there's been a disaster in St. Charles Luanga. College, St. Charles Wanga Mission, that uh, the boulders from the mountain have come and struck the, the school, and three people have died two students and, and uh, our security night watchman, who was in the dining hall at the time when the, when the mudslides happened. And it, they flattened the dining hall completely, and then the boulders hit into the, the hostels. This is where our two young men died. Um, so it was a very traumatic experience. Um, the following morning, that same morning, Saturday morning, we, we gathered together all of our different commissions, those particularly responsible to, uh, to react to such disasters. So from that day onwards was a constant um, trying to get funding 
for, for the relief program. Uh, the children, in our own case, the children were, and the uh, people were, um, uh, what can we say, they were within inside the mission, they couldn't leave. The roads were all blocked. So that was a big task to try to get the children out, to get them back to their families. Those, uh, there were, we had no, we had a few in, a few boys who were injured, but not seriously. Um, so I think it was on the Monday they were rescued and they were brought to the training center where we all met them together with the PED, Mr. Shomba and others. Um, and all that week then we were in touch until I went down there myself on the Friday where we had to walk from, from Skyview over the trees and everything and to see the destruction that had happened and then to see the mission ourselves. So it will always remain one of those days that I will never forget and um, you know what the power of nature was unleashed that night. That, uh, and I think it's still in now in the psychic, the collective psychic of the people of um, Manikaland, especially in the Chimani Mani uh, uh, Shipingi area, even with the recent tropical storm Freddy, uh, you know, it, is, it brings back the memories again. So we're all now a bit more sensitive to television reports or forecasts that there might be something coming in from the Indian Ocean coming to Mozambique and then coming first to Manikaland uh, here in Zimbabwe. Mm. I, I was privileged um, to, to visit um, St. Charles Luanga post the, um, the, 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 the Cyclone Idai era. The, the, the damage there was quite shocking. Has, has, has your diocese recovered from that? I mean, particularly the institutions of the church that were affected. I know you um, wanted to, you know, relocate that school as, as a diocese. How is that process? Have you recovered from that? Yeah, I would say to in the infrastructure, generally, I think the government did uh, quite a good work in restoring the roads and access to places and even have tarred some of the roads. So, and then has enhanced in some way the beauty of the, of the, the area. For ourselves, um, we were advised by two reports. We got two different uh, engineers to come to assess the damage at the mission. And the likelihood of a future happening of the same nature. So we, we ultimately took the decision that we would have to um, move to another um, setting, the boarding facility. Um, it was a boys school. Originally it was a seminary. Then it became a boys uh, secondary school. Uh, so that at the mission now it, we have now turned it into a day school. And it's quite, it's flourishing actually. We've received in uh, many new uh, students. But the boarding unit we have transferred to a, a, a place called Rovaka near Nedziwa. Uh, we, we thank the government of Zimbabwe for donating land to us to build a new, a new school, which we have called St. Charles Lewanga College. And uh, we have more or less completed the uh, Form 1 and 2 hostels and are now working on the dining hall and the kitchen uh, complex. And we hoped also then to, thanks to a donation from the, from the Beyond Cyclone Idai um, committee from the uh, Jesuit uh, family, we are hoping to start the building of classrooms uh, now this year. So the target would be that we may be open uh, to open the school in January 2024, depending on how what progress we can make this year. Mm. Generally, what do you think we need to do as a church and also maybe as a country in terms of disaster management or disaster response? Well, we have ourselves, we have set up our own disaster committee and which actually met last Friday in, in, in preparation for, for cyclone or tropical storm Freddy. Thankfully, it didn't materialize as maybe we might thought, have thought, certainly in, in Mutari area. Um, but I think we need to be on alert, with, especially with climate change now, um, warming the oceans. We're, on, we're very near the Indian Ocean. Um, tropical storm Freddy had started off the coast of Australia and was being mapped for a number of days 
until it, it entered, uh, hit um, Madagascar. So I think both the government and all institutions is just going to be part of our existence, especially here in Manicaland, but not only Manicaland, you know, even Cyclone, uh, Tropical Storm Freddy has touched um, Mashingo and other parts of the country. So I think we, we have to take it seriously and to be prepared in a practical basis. We're thinking ourselves of building a disaster management yard with, uh, with a certain amount of um, storage for items, um, maybe using containers or having a warehouse where we, we will have our own amount of materials that can be used in the case of people who are stranded or people who are in need of desperate help very, very quickly. So we're, we're, we're working in that mode now that to expect maybe every year something that will affect us in, in, in a fairly serious way in terms of, of, of climate and, and the weather. Mm. That would be um, a great relief, I think, for the people who are affected um, by these um, uh, natural disasters. Let's talk about what is happening in the Catholic Church right now. There is um, a synod on synodality process that is going on. In your view, how has this process been conducted in Zimbabwe? I know now we are on a continental stage where different um, representatives from conferences, from the lay people, are discussing um, issues that affect uh, the church here in Africa. But in your view, how has this process gone in Zimbabwe? It's been quite, uh, quite, it's maybe one might call it a quite revolution. Um, I think fundamentally it is about changing attitudes um, and opening ourselves up to a new experience of being the family of God, being the part of God's kingdom. In that, especially for us in leadership, um, we have to really try to follow the example of Pope Francis in um, seeing that the Holy Spirit uh, works uh, through from the very first day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down on the apostles in Jerusalem. He not only came down on the apostles, but he came down on all the people gathered there. So I think this is more or less a return maybe to the, to the energy and dynamism that captured the early church. And it will be, it'll call for a, maybe a, a change in our style of relating to, to people generally, but also to the style of leadership that will be asked of bishops and priests and pastors and all Christian leaders um, as this Senate, uh, as this attitude uh, of um, inclusivity and uh, attitude of um, awe towards all people, that uh, the Holy Spirit is, is able to direct uh, his church, and we have to participate in that directing, in that direction. Um, you know, respecting the roles that we have been given and the responsibilities we have been given. But um, just now being conscious that the issue of consultation has to be now more, maybe more um, organized and more systematic uh, than maybe before. We have a number of consultative bodies in every diocese uh, as uh, set out in the kind of law of the church, the law of the church, but perhaps they need to be more expanded more, not just at the level of the diocese, but even at the level of, of parishes and congregations. Um, so for Zimbabwe, I think uh, maybe sharing the reactions of the other bishops, I would think we, we are we're quite interested and we're quite um, happy with what is happening. Um, I think from the very beginning, uh, it was stated that it, this is not going to affect the, the teaching of the church generally, the, the fundamental teaching that goes back to the, the teaching of Christ. But how it's lived, how it's presented, how, how it's you know, advertised, so to speak, in this generation and in this part of the world, it can all they're always it's always um, subject to change and uh, to to improvement and generated by a new zeal uh, of the Holy Spirit being released in us and in the and in our people. 
some people had concerns that you know this process would harm the church. Um, certainly, some um, religious people also had worries. You know, getting a lot of lay people saying a lot of um, what they think about the, how the church should work, uh, how you know people should be ministered to. Have you had concerns from some of the religious people about how this process may not be good for the church? And how do you react to that? I've been reading reports mainly from other parts of the world uh, where uh, people are a little fearful that the, the structures and the order in the Catholic Church, and the Church has been known for its order uh, and its regulation, um, but I don't think um, it's, it's something that people need to fear. Um, it's giving the opportunity for lay people uh, to take their rightful place in, in, the, in the church. Uh, Pope Francis has mentioned the importance of the sacrament of baptism as the, the, the one sacrament that we all celebrate. We're all, you know, baptized into the body of Christ. We're not, we're not ordained priests before baptism or, or any other ceremony or sacrament we may celebrate. We're all baptized into the body of Christ. And as from the beginning, uh, people have different roles to, to, to take and to accept, knowing that it, a higher force is guiding things. Um, we must remember that the Holy Spirit was the quiet person of the Holy Trinity for about 1500 years. The Holy Spirit was very active and in the, in the readings and writings of the early fathers of the church, both in the, what is called the Western Church and in the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church, the Holy Spirit was very, very seen to be very active. Um, but after the Roman Empire, um, in a sense, gave um, acceptance to, to the Christian religion, um, the Catholic Church, in a sense, took on the, the, real, the, the structures of the Roman Empire. Uh, the order that was in the Roman Empire in some way uh, had a big influence on how the church spread to, to every part of the world. And which is, so we have order, and which is a great gift, and, and we have uh, unity, unity in the church. So I think we, we, now the Holy Spirit, since the 1960s, especially with the charismatic movement, but even now more generally, we are beginning to come to know the person of the Holy Spirit. Um, as, as Jesus said, uh, I will, will, the advocate will come that will lead you into the whole truth. Um, and he will bring to mind what I've been saying to you, but you haven't fully accepted it. So I think we're in the time of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of truth. And I don't think we need to be so afraid just to, you know, to carry on the orthodox teaching of the church, but presenting it in a way which is very attractive to the people of this time, uh, which will bring happiness to people. So before we hear um, about the results or discussions going on on the continental stage, and also uh, eventually when the bishops uh, and other selected people will meet um, for, 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 for this synod, how can local parishes fully utilize this this framework this process to you know maybe to discuss and find some local solutions on on some of the problems or issues raised as bishops we we uh, of zimbabwe we wish not to wait to the very end when pope francis will issue his um apostolic uh, exhortation uh, following the 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 final session of the Synod in 2024. We, we, we have our own plenary meeting here in, in, in Harare in April, where ourselves and many people will be invited, religious and lay people, uh, to look at what we can begin implementing even now uh, from the fruits of the discussions and the sharings that have gone on in Zimbabwe. But also taking into account the insights coming from other parts of the world, uh, especially using the continental document, which was the same document for all, all continents. So that, that's our, our task to, to, um, to see how we can open up more to uh, people, uh, lay people in particular, who 
uh, you know, they have strong faith, uh, many times much stronger than even our, ourselves and our priests and religious, to give them maybe new opportunities to serve the church um, and to, you know, to help them to realize that they have an important part to play in the life of the church as parents, in their families, in the parishes, as, as lay leaders. Um, here in, in Mutari, we have a two-year program for the training of catechists uh, for all the whole diocese, a new program we've started. And we hope also now to have another training program for our lecturers and acolytes, um, but also just generally to encourage people to offer themselves in leadership roles. During the COVID era, elections were suspended, well, certainly here in Mutari, but so we're going to elections in September at a, a section level, outstation level, parish level, deanery, and then at diocesan level. So we would encourage people to, to come forward uh, that uh, they also have something unique to, to offer to the local uh, Christian community, to the local Catholic community uh, in, their, in their individual diocese. So I, I think the whole area of trying to get the views of other people uh, will be an important aspect of the lives of bishops and will be also encouraging our priests to, to listen to your people. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you and to your parish, through, through everyone in the parish. Um, so even our youths, our young people, uh, the different um, guild structures that we have in the country, that um, we want to give the Holy Spirit as much you know, space to operate, maybe a bit more widespread or more effectively than we have allowed them to do so, maybe within our existing church structures. Before we take a break, um, let's look a little bit about education and particularly Catholic education. The church is involved in, um, historically has been involved in educating the people of Zimbabwe and currently has so many schools. And some of them, if not many of them, are not in good shape. How do you evaluate, I mean, our, our education system, our infrastructure in education currently? The education system suffered greatly during COVID-19, the COVID-19 period. Even the quality of results went down because students were out, out of school for so long. Uh, teachers got uh, demotivated um, because fees were being paid in RTGS, in, in the Zim dollar. Uh, often when the fees were set at the EGM of, of, of the parents, by, by three or four months those fees were, were worth not so much. So schools concentrated on in, uh, in doing the basics, providing the teaching materials in a boarding school, providing, providing food and all else that goes with running a boarding school, and development halted, and one might say even maintenance halted. So that's why many of our schools, the infrastructure suffered greatly. So now that things are picking up again, um, parents are paying, uh, if they wish to, uh, in US dollars, their school fees. The fees are holding their value. Now we see already schools trying to pick up where they left off uh, at the beginning of, of COVID. So I think over the next number of years, you will see our, our schools uh, returning to what they were and even blooming even more. That's on the, on the we'll say, the physical side of it. Um, as, as a Catholic uh, school system, um, we always uh, emphasize the holistic aspect of education, that academic uh, success must be combined with uh, a maturing of the individual and in so many other levels, in their, their social skills, their, their morals that they take into the world, their relationship with God, their spiritual lives, um, and their cultural appreciation of the country that God, they, God has put them in. So we always, uh, enhance, we always emphasize that the student will do better academically if the other 
uh, aspects of education are attended to. That we have, we want good students leaving our schools at O level or A level who are going to become good citizens of Zimbabwe or even good citizens of the world. Because as we know, many of our, many of our people, you know, choose to now to go and work and live in other parts of the world. So we want them to be good ambassadors coming from the education that they have received, um, maybe especially in our own Catholic schools, but also in, a, in, in the mission schools of many churches. You'll see that forming of the, the holistic person is there. And this is something we believe is very important that we would want to continue into the future. Sakurupo Oran, welcome back. Thank you. The, you as bishops, um, you released um, a signed pastoral letter for Lent, uh, breaking the unjust fetters, which looked at um, the, the repentant side of individuals, but also had um, um, a call for people to, you know, do their civic duties during the forthcoming general elections in Zimbabwe. Can you briefly share with us what were your main messages and what, what is your thinking as the bishops then? Every year we release two pastoral letters um, as we approach the season of Advent before um, around November time and especially before the season of Lent, um, which is the 40 days preparation for the celebration of the sacrifice of Christ and his resurrection from the dead. It's say in the Catholic tradition in particular, it's a time of um, when we are called to um, repent, to return to God. And uh, in the tradition of the church, from the Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, we're called to fast more, to fast from um, what maybe have been the bad things in our lives in particular, to pray more and uh, to be ready to share our goods more and our time and to be to become better people during the season of, of Lent. So as Pope Francis has issued a letter for the whole world for the time, uh, uh, for the whole church for the season of Lent, we, uh, like other bishops' conferences, have issued our own letter for our own uh, people here in Zimbabwe. And this year we we is called uh, uh, to release the unjust, fe unjust fetters, which is a quotation from the uh, prophet Isaiah. Uh, so it was focusing in on the, the state of the country and uh, the hardships that people are still enduring uh, and the suffering that people uh, are going through, especially the poorest, the poor, with so many still just trying to eke out a living each day for their family, to bring ho something home to put on the table uh, in the evening. So we, we, we did uh, speak a lot about this whole area of corruption uh, in the country. Uh, uh, Zimbabwe has been blessed with, I think, every mineral there is in the world. And as in recent times, um, the, uh, the new mineral of lithium, which has become so critical with the production of batteries and electrical cars, uh, God has blessed this country with uh, uh, Zimbabwe being the sixth um, biggest, uh, have, having the sixth biggest reserve of lithium in the world. Um, so the whole area of, of corruption um, is, has to be addressed. Uh, we have uh, many resources, not only minerals, but also our good land, our educated people. Um, but it hasn't been coming together. The, the fruits are not being seen, except for maybe a small minority of people that we notice are driving around with big cars, and we, we see them. Uh, we see the, the traffic on the road in our in our cities, but for the vast majority of people, they're still um, living in very poor conditions, in poor living conditions, and with uh, with very little money to provide for their families. So corruption really eats into the, the life of a country. Uh, corruption basically means that if I'm corrupt, I'm taking something from myself which belongs to others, that belongs to the people. Um, if I'm evading tax, if I'm getting kickbacks, if I'm taking bribes, 
if I'm insisting on bribes for some work, it means that that cost has to be met by others. Uh, or that money that I've taken for myself that should have gone to provide better education, better roads, um, or just better services for the people. So people suffer when there is corruption. One person uh, benefits, I benefit, but my brothers and sisters um, uh, suffer in the consequence. So we, that needs to be addressed in the country. Perhaps one of the reasons for, for corruption in so many walks of life is that people feel they're not being rewarded sufficiently for the work that they do. Um, in our public servants or even in the private sector. So people think, I'm, I have, I can I, uh, I can, I'm entitled to take more because I'm not getting rewarded as I ought to get. Um, or I've given a lot of public service to the people and they don't seem to appreciate it. So I must get rewarded myself, maybe by benefiting from my office. But we would, we, as Pope Francis said, uh, corruption is really a cancer uh, that can really eat into our hearts. Because we know as Catholics, as Christians, we stand in the presence of God every moment. That everything we do here on earth, we have to give an answer to. So if I have stolen money, it's better that I repay that money before I complete my life on earth. Otherwise, I go with that sin, with that fault on my soul before our Heavenly Father. So we're all encouraged from the smallest things to, to the big um, items of, to stop corruption because it's only going to bring you unhappiness and guilt and regret that you will carry maybe to your grave. And so it's a serious issue for the, for the economic re revival of our country um, because corruption, it really drives away investment, in, especially international investment. And as we know, sadly, Zimbabwe is quite high up on, on the list of uh, corrupt countries in the world. So we need to get a good reputation as being an honest and truthful people. And that business is done in a truthful way in Zimbabwe. So that will attract uh, international vectors into the country even more so that our economy can, can even begin to grow stronger over the coming years. When people suffer, sometimes they lose their voice. And sometimes they expect the bishops to be their voice. And sometimes people accuse, if I can use that word, the bishops of not doing enough to speak truth to power and, you know, to stand for the people. How easy or how difficult is that to do? You know, considering that some of the politicians, some of the uh, powerful people who are corrupt, who are doing all these injustices, are, could also be Catholics or go to other churches. How easy or how difficult is that? It is difficult. We, we tr generally try to apply a two-pronged approach uh, to make public statements, uh, as we have done with the, uh, with the pastor letter, as we have done when... There's been occasions of violence, and as we will shall continue doing, especially in the period up to election day and afterwards, in response to what is happening on the ground. The other prong is to meet the leaders directly, which we have been doing. They don't generally get publicity, but um, we do bring forth um, the issues that are at hand, um, and we often notice change, uh, and even maybe maybe to give credit to the situation now. We, we can say that the country in many ways has improved, but uh, we can't attribute that improvement to uh, our own per particular interventions. Um, but sometimes um, we have noticed that often our government reacts more, uh, more quickly and, uh, more, uh, uh, and more, um, more comprehensively when we bring issues directly to them rather than through uh, maybe a more uh, public forum. But the two, the two must go along because we, we also are responsible for our people and they need to know that we are active on their behalf in, in bringing their causes to, to those who have the responsibility for, for their well-being and their economic development. One of the calls in the pastoral letter are for people to 
elect leaders and to know what they want from from these elections what are your hopes in this coming election well I, my hope is uh, like the hope i think of uh, that president monagua mentioned there uh, last week i think when he was addressing um uh, the forum on on the reduction of, of our debt uh, in the country we have a debt of 18 billion us dollars uh, in zimbabwe that there would be free and uh, fair elections. Um, and that free means that people are free to exercise their, their right to vote, that they are encouraged to register, that they listen to the different uh, manifestos, the different views of the different parties, and then they freely choose. So for an election to be free and fair, there's no room for any form of um, intimidation or any kind of forcing people to vote. There's a difference between a free vote and a forced vote. And I think our leaders would always want to say, I, the people freely voted for me. I'm in this office uh, and the mandate of the people. And we can say that is then the voice of the people. When the people are freely able to cast their vote, they're not being uh, you know, persuaded through gifts or bribes or corruption. They're not being forced maybe by the local traditional leader, leaders to vote in a particular way. But they, they, they are exercising their right to vote in, in a free way, taking the views of all the different particular parties, the experiences that they have had, and bringing their decision before God. Then they freely choose and going for, to go for this particular candidate for the president, this particular um, member, person for the member of parliament, this particular person for my own ward. And um, that is what would be, our, uh, as bishops, we would want that to be the case, because we know God will bless the country then, because the people's rights have been respected. Uh, and God wants his people's rights to be respected, and he will bless the country abundantly uh, and we'll see a huge change in Zimbabwe uh, if again it's like almost the synod process we were talking about earlier that the voice of the people uh, inspired we believe from the spirit of wisdom coming from God that we will the, that the country will end up uh, with leaders which are you know chosen by the people but also uh, chosen by God this year in March, March 13 in particular, uh, to be specific, we will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of the election of Pope Francis. How much impact has he have had on, on you as a priest, as a bishop, as a Catholic? He succeeded Pope Benedict XVI, who we pray for his eternal rest, who went to the Lord recently. Um, coming out from a, a time in the church where it, the atmosphere was different, one would say a uh, more restricted atmosphere and more control perhaps exercised, especially from uh, the Holy See. Um, but we've seen quite a shift. It's still going on with the style of Pope Francis, and every pope has his his own particular style. Just like any, every bishop. Uh, every bishop also. <laughs> so uh, we, we can see it's, it's a little... Um, uh, what's been, what's difficult to accept at the beginning is kind of opening up things. But I think he's really living out his Jesuit formation. Uh, that's how I understand Pope Francis. He's first of all a Jesuit. He was formed as a Jesuit. And the whole Jesuit spirituality is allow is this word which we call discernment, to discern where the, the the spirit, what spirit is guiding us, is it a good spirit or a bad spirit? What is the movement? Where is where can we see the signs, the Holy Spirit guide in the church? Um, so once we accept that, even for myself uh, as bishop, it has made me more relaxed because I feel that I don't have to do everything as a bishop. That uh, what I need to do as much as I can is to facilitate our priests and religious and our lay people just accepting the vocation that they have received.
and that they can live to the full and so that they will produce the fruit and uh, as you know uh, myself I'll admire what they have been able to do uh, by in some way facilitating an atmosphere where people will feel overjoyed to even share their faith with other people uh, and to be to be free before God not to be uh, we don't want any fear in our country we don't want any fear in the church either that um, we are called to be we're called to be children of God and that we, we are so I think his papacy is we wouldn't be having a synod only for the style of uh, Pope Francis is there. As I say, he has his critics. They think he's maybe letting things too loose. Or, but he's always been very orthodox. And he's just, I, I think, trying to get the people of God to, to realize the dignity and the, the, the place they have in the building up of the kingdom of God. That, uh, Hopefully, this August, you will be meeting with young people in Lisbon for the World Youth Day. And as a local church, I mean, how do you see our church responding to the challenges that young people are facing today? Yes, uh, the whole continent in Africa is, is a youthful continent. And like uh, also in Zimbabwe, we have you know, the majority of people are, are younger people now. It's, it's, it's the biggest resource we actually have in the country, besides our other physical resources. And um, as, a, as a church, and as a Catholic church in particular, um, we would like to have a situation where every student passes all level. I think this is the beginning of the problems we have with our young people that our school system still is not uh, enabling our young people to go out into the world after their formal education. Um, we ourselves have plans to, to build or to have more vocation centers because even in our own schools, we'll have always a percentage of students that will not pass their full O levels. So we have to care for those people either to get them to Re, to, to repeat those subjects that they haven't passed, or those who, who probably will find it difficult to pass, to have other opportunities for them. I have to ad, uh, admit that we've been, we haven't been doing enough to try to walk with those students once they leave our institution. So this is why they often end up with very um, poor employment prospects. And then they may even turn, as we see now, even to, to taking some drugs that will take away the pain of their lives. So we think it's to, the, the solution is probably to, to on skills, that we can give our young people skills, whether it's motor mechanics, whether it's to be a doctor, whichever, every person has unique gift and a unique gift to help him to, to get through this world that none of us are without gifts. Um, but perhaps even in our own schools, we've often been emphasizing maybe the academic side um, or the academic achievements of, of the minority, maybe at the expense of the majority that are finding it difficult to get through this life. So I think we need to have a, maybe a, a paradigm shift there to focus more on those who are not going to be doing so well in their exams. There have been, you mentioned uh, drug and substance abuse. There have been other issues that are affecting young people. For example, child marriages, issues to do with um, unemployment, but generally issues to do with young people's participation in their, in their communities. What is your advice to young people today? Yes, um, I'm someone a bit much older than them, so maybe the advice would come from themselves, but maybe just to offer what I feel that um, might assist them is that they, that personal conviction that they are a child of God. Um, uh, and this needs to be nurtured in an early stage in them. And this is why we see our schools as, as very important that if, if they, 
if the only the, the only criteria you know, people are seeing are criteria of this world in terms of success and achievements. But if they haven't come to the conviction that they're a child, a beloved child of God, with a unique work to do here on earth and a, a unique destiny, then they are very likely, especially those who are not finding uh, success in this world or success in, in their various occupations, then more than likely they are the ones who are going to maybe have some mental health issues or they're going to turn to uh, substance abuse. Um, so I would have to say maybe it's not so such an attractive message, so to speak, but for them to reach the, the inner conviction and uh, certainty that I'm a beloved child of God and God has a plan for my life, even though it may seem it doesn't look so good. But uh, that is there, that the power of God can work in their lives if they can just give him a chance to do so. Um, of course, we can encourage them to be, to be positive, maybe to participate as much as possible in sports, in their particular interest that they have, and to, to, to set goals for their lives, uh, given the material that they have of their lives, that things can uh, can improve and uh, you know will improve if they if they remain positive. But having said that, the circumstances can be so so difficult for them. So we just want to walk with them and to pray for them and to 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 remind them of the dignity they have. It doesn't come from what they own or what they wear or who they're related to. It comes from their unique dignity as a child of God. You serve as the Bishop Chairman of Social Communications. What is your advice to people working in Catholic media or Catholics working in media in general? Many people in our day will never enter a church, a church building, or if they do, maybe very, very seldom. So in one sense, the, the new uh, what we call the ambo or the place where the preacher preaches, the priest or whoever else, is now in some sense uh, the social media. Uh, it reaches people that may no longer be reached by the traditional means. So my encouragement would be to, 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 to accept um, that we need to accept that and that we saw even during the COVID years how limited we were because we hadn't uh, accepted fully or incorporated this dimension to our, our preaching the Word of God or our uh, work of spreading the Word of God. So, uh, social media, one could compare it, it's like a, like a knife. A knife is very useful for cutting bread or cutting butter or anything. But a knife can also be a dangerous object. The social media is likewise, is, is good and bad. The main, uh, the main um, object for it is to make it good, to fill the social media with the goodness of God, with the grace of God. Uh, and this we do so by, uh, by preaching the Word of God and using every opportunity to bring goodness. Maybe sometimes it's not specifically on the Christian message, but whenever we can promote goodness and uh, well-being of others, we're doing God's work, and now this is the platform that is presented to the church and presented to the whole world. Perhaps it's a sign that the kingdom of God is, is actually coming very close, that the whole world can be now contacted, so to speak, so quickly. Um, and we have, we've got to overcome the badness that is there. You know, the pornography, the, the violence, and with the goodness that, we, that the human being is and the goodness that we share together and the, the goodness of God that is releasing into his people so that we overcome all the evil uh, that may be on the internet and the social media by, by the grace of God, by the goodness of God that we live as individuals and as we maybe can share as Christians and even as bishops. If you were to speak for other bishops, what would you say are your dreams and aspirations for the local church? 
we, I think we have a good base in Zimbabwe. Um, compared to other African countries, the number of, uh, we'll say, so-called subscribed Catholics is the percentage is quite low compared to, we'll say, Uganda, even Malawi, um, Tanzania, even Nigeria. Um, so, but I think we have a good faith, faith base. Um, those who are coming to church or accessing the church to, through social media, they are committed. Um, but I think we've been a quiet church, maybe a bit too quiet. And uh, the good news we have is really good. Perhaps we need to do more to, to share it with others using all the means that are, are possible, but also to encourage all our people to become, as Pope Francis mentioned, missionary disciples, that um, we don't have to leave it to someone in leadership or so-called leadership positions, but each person can become an instrument that God can use to bring his, his, his life and his love to other people. So it's really aspirations really of the, of the synod process to, to some extent that our church can broaden out to include everyone and that all our people can really take their part in building up, uh, building up the church and, and building up uh, the kingdom here in Zimbabwe. Thank you very much, Sekuru. But as we conclude, what is your message to Catholics watching this interview? What do you want to say to them? I just want to encourage you uh, to be receptive, to be receptive uh, to the reality that God loves you in your own uniqueness and that he has a particular plan for your life. Uh, you are a unique expression of his love uh, to the world, uh, to the people your own families and to the people of Zimbabwe. So my message would be that you receive the love of God. God has loved us first and then we respond to that love. So my message today would be for you to open your hearts to receive God's love, to be overpowered by God's love and in turn to fall in love with God, to offer him your whole life so that he can uh, revolutionize your whole life and that you may fulfill the particular dream he has put into your heart for you to fulfill during your years here on earth. So please pray for me also. Thank you very much, Sekuru. And there you have it. Uh, that was uh, His Lordship, the Bishop of Tare, and also the President of the Zimbabwe Catholic Bishops. Thank you for watching. Please continue to subscribe and share this interview with friends and family. For now, it's bye.